Welcome back to the lab. Today we're going to continue our electronic load prototyping by adding a 10-bit SPI ADC to our breadboard. It's going to be awesome. Let's dive in. Remembering the architecture that we're developing, we've got a SPI DAC and a SPI ADC, and those serve a very important purpose for this electronic load project. They allow for precise control of and monitoring of some potentially high power, high voltage electronics. Pretty cool stuff. Of course, that won't work well if we can't talk to it. So let's finish developing our SPI driver that should, in theory, get some great data from the ADC. But before we dive into that, I want to set some background by talking about what an ADC is, how it works, and why what we're doing today is bad, and why I feel bad for being bad. Basically, an ADC is a mixed signal device. Uh, what does that mean? That means that there's a part of this electronic circuit that is a switching device, a digital device. It has the SPI digital communication protocol running in half the device. Then of course, there's the other half, which is there to quantize a sensitive analog signal and convert it into something that can be transmitted over that SPI digital interface. Hmm. Why is that important? Well. Because there's inherently a problem when you put something at 10 megahertz switching right next to something that's a sensitive analog circuit. The edges, those high volt change per second, those high DVDT events, will couple some energy back into that sensitive analog net and corrupt the signal. Potentially, it could. Let's look at some of the design features baked into that ADS7041 from Texas Instruments. Let's start by looking at the timing diagram. And here's what immediately stands out to me. Remember what we just said about that issue with digital and analog circuitry functioning at the same time in the same device? Well, TI found a very clever way around that. They don't. See, notice how the chip select uh, happens. Uh, you're talking great. You get some leading zeros, you get your data. And then when chip select goes high, it immediately starts processing the next sample. Why is that important? Well, because that's usually when you're not talking to anything else. So you're doing the conversion when the spy bus is idle. Perfect. That's exactly when you would like to be doing the conversion because then you don't have all that 10 megahertz stuff coming back around. Now there's something else that's pretty cool about this device and that is they describe the sample and hold architecture with the equivalent sampling resistor capacitor. Apparently there's a 50 ohm input impedance and some uh, coupling between the positive and negative input. It looks fine to me. Looks fine to me. And this is very important because basically when you do sample, you are connecting a capacitive load to whatever analog net is there. And you should expect to see a little dip and then a recovery of the voltage at that AN positive or negative. It's just something to keep in mind when you're working with a sample and hold ADC. So then of course, decoupling capacitors, they serve the same function as always. They're there to stabilize your analog reference, to stabilize the inputs. Perhaps it might make sense to have some capacitance near the ADC so that when it uh, tries to sample, it can gulp that current from a local capacitor. Maybe that doesn't make sense, just something to think about. Um, this ADC needs decoupling capacitors on the analog and digital inputs for power. And on this dev board, like DAC, the ADC has no decoupling. That's going to be a problem. Well, it might be, but let's just power on forward anyways, and, and let's see how far we can get. Speaking of how far we can get, our code, we've got the, the protocol, we pulled it out of the data sheet again, and basically what we're doing is we're just going to read the counts from the ADC. And the way that this works is we've got now a 10 bit result and that's coming out of 16 bits of data. And the way that we convert that back is we need to shift the first byte that we read up four bits and then the lower data down four bits. And then you add the two results and that gets you your data ranging from zero to 1024. Good stuff. And that's basically all we're doing. And I'm about to connect it to what should be approximately 3.3 volts. What do we measure? We measure 908. So we would expect that to be 2.92 volts. Yeah, 3.1. Uh, it's not great, but there is no decoupling on the analog reference. 
So there's that. I'd say that's close enough for what we've got going right now. Uh, the critical, critical, critical test is going to be if we take this wire and we connect it back to that AREF pin, we should see 1024 all day, every day. 1022, that's pretty darn close. And the big difference that we're seeing there, right, is even if the analog reference dips when we're sampling, even if the lack of decoupling causes it to be distorted, we would expect that it would pull it down where we're measuring as well. So they should proportionally dip and we should still see basically 1024 if our software is working correctly. That's a great spot check. But what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna switch the camera around a little bit. We're gonna reframe this shot and I'm going to wire up the ADC to monitor the DAC with a different piece of software and see how that goes. Feels good to be pointing the camera at some tech. We've rewritten the script to function more like what I expect we will need in the future. Basically, instead of the ADC git function, I've made an ADC git millivolts function where you give it the chip select pin and the VREF voltage, and it will translate that back into volts, which is pretty great. We got the ADC sampling 10 times for every time the DAC changes. So in theory, if we use this here resistor network to shift the DAC volt, if we use the resistor network to translate the five volt output down to 3.3 volt range, and that's 5K on the top, 10K on the bottom, dividing by two thirds or whatever, multiplying by two thirds. Um, what we should see is that when we set the DAC to 255, we should measure 3.3 volts on the output. We're measuring 1.7 volts and we're getting not even close in our measurement not even close okay let's just let it keep going see what happens see if we snap back no okay so now we're getting about a 1.2 volts when we're reading 2.2 but now it seems to be going about one to one now we're reading 2.2 1.8 1 yeah 1.8 1.9 up to 2.3 volts Interesting. I wonder if a part of this is because of the VREF, and if another part of the error is coming from the fact that we're basically measuring from a really high impedance net. Look at that, we're getting up 2.7 volts. Hey, no, we're at 2.7 volts. So that is super accurate right now. Measuring around three volts, we're at 2.8. Yeah. Okay, so it seems fairly accurate up at the high end of the output voltage. And then we switch back around to zero volts and we're getting very close to zero volts. Right now we're measuring 190 on the output and we're getting 200 at the DMM. 500 at the DMM, 400 at the ADC. Nope, oh, sorry, probe got loose. Yeah. So there's that weird intermediate range where we seem to go out to lunch. I'll need to think about that. I need to dig in the data sheet, figure that out. That, uh, it's a little concerning, but we checked it at high voltages and it was fine. Checked it at low voltages and it was fine. Checked it in the middle. We're in a pretty good place. We're in a pretty good place. So, I'm feeling pretty good about that. Like, it's not perfect, but running an ADC without decoupling caps off of a imprecise linear regulator as your voltage reference, not very accurate, not very precise, I think that's fine. Like, this is working. We are getting data from the ADC that makes sense after writing data to the DAC. Well, I think that's just as good a place to stop off as any. And if you like this video, can't wait for more, let me know by getting subscribed, hitting that like button, and leaving a comment down below. Coming up soon, we'll be prototyping the user interface in the UART control mode, and I can't wait. So if you want to support the channel, consider checking out our Patreon page linked in the description. It really helps out a lot, so thank you. Yes, thank you to everyone who's decided to become a member. You're a big part of keeping this all possible. 
Most of all, I hope that you learned something great today, and I hope to see you again soon. So thanks for watching EE for everyone, and thank you for staying till the end. Bye!